Early 19th century Battle of Waterloo is one of the most famous battles in history. There, Napoleon suffered his final defeat, losing to the force made of British, Dutch, Prussian and other Allies troops. Almost 200,000 souls fought over a course of one day on a tiny battlefield just miles across. That event possibly changed the course of history for Europe. But imagine this. A lone modern main battle tank travels from the future and appears in Napoleon's camp on the morning of the battle. How would such a piece of technology change the course of the battle? And using the tank, would Napoleon's army have crushed the British, the Prussians and their allies? The main battle tank traveling from the future into the year 1815 could of course have been any of the modern day tanks. Pretty much any of these would yield similar results, for example the US Abrams, German Leo II, British Challenger II, French Leclerc or even the latest variants of Russian and Chinese tanks, just to name a few. But to keep to the spirit of the whole battle, we'll stick with the French-made Leclerc. It's a tank devised in the 1980s and first delivered in 1992. It's got modern modular armor that's way, way off an overkill for 1815, essentially impenetrable. It's got a three-member crew, commander, gunner and a driver. It uses an autoloader and has a 120mm gun. Its latest version, delivered to the French army, is called Leclerc XLR. After a prototype was tested in 2022, two serial tanks were delivered this past June, with 16 more to follow by the end of the year. So, let's imagine one of those brand new XLR tanks got whisked away with a trained crew and possibly with some support as well, into 1815. Now, exactly when the tank arrives could change a lot. Arriving days earlier, it could possibly influence Prussian and British maneuvers before the Battle of Waterloo. Famously, Napoleon wanted to fight one side first, then the other, instead of letting Prussians and Anglo-Allied armies combine. He knew his troops were more experienced and that way, in two sequential battles, he actually might have stood a chance. But the smaller battles prior to the Battle of Waterloo did not produce the desired results. And he didn't weaken enough either Wellington and his allies or the Prussians. The decisive Battle of Waterloo had Napoleon under pressure. He had to attack Wellington and his forces before Prussians came to help him. But that attack had to be postponed by several hours due to rain. Rain could not be foreseen. On the fateful night of June 17th and the morning of June 18th, a lot of rain fell onto the soft soil around the village of Waterloo, itself just miles away from Brussels. Napoleon thus had to wait. Even though he already had breakfast at 7 am, the attack itself started only after the soil was dry enough so a few hundred cannons could be dragged around and thousands of cavalrymen could successfully maneuver. So in the real timeline, that was around 11 am, possibly a bit later. Ultimately, Napoleon lost that battle. After a few failed charges against Wellington's defending forces, the French were already weary. And then the Prussians came and flanked them in an attack. Of course, right at the start, the arrival of the modern tank from the future would start to change that entire course of events. Now, as always with these time travel videos, a lot of things have to be ignored. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible to explore the technical effects of such a force addition. For example, if no one knew anything about the tank and Napoleon would not trust the tank crew, then the tank would not get used at all. The opposing side would plausibly just run away in fear, seeing such a contraption shooting away their mates. That's not what we want to explore. We want to see how an early 19th century force would do against a lone tank, if fighting to the best of their ability and not running away. So what's needed is that both the French and their opponents get word about the incoming tank. They all get a vague idea of what a tank is and what it can do. Anyway, cutting his breakfast short, Napoleon inspects the tank and its crew, which traveled through time as well, magically trusting them and magically soaking up the knowledge how to utilize them. So then the crew gets the go-ahead to participate in the battle, following instructions. Still, all that takes some time, so it's likely the tank itself doesn't start its mission before 9 am or so. That's a few hours earlier than the real timeline French force started its attack. The tank comes with all the equipment inside it, of course, which means some personal portable radios are also available to the tank's crew members. 
so it's likely one would be issued to the French command, so it can talk to the tank. Such handheld radios do have range issues, but the whole battlefield in Waterloo was roughly 4x4 four four kilometers. The tank would often get outside of radio range if it would go around Anglo-Allied flanks, but it would periodically get back into range to report and get new orders. That's still much faster than issuing messengers on horseback. But let's get back to the rain-soaked soil. As we said, Napoleon postponed his real timeline attack due to that. The tank, however, would have no such limitation. Tanks are sometimes labeled as prone to getting stuck in mud. Sure, it can happen in heavy mud, but the situation wasn't that dire. Already from 11 am, when the real timeline attack started, guns could be moved around. Napoleon's guns from that era, the 12-pounders, weighed little under 2 tons, complete with the barrel, carriage and limber cart. Sizing up the wheels on the gun carriage and limber cart, one gets roughly 980 kilopascals of ground pressure, or roughly 140 psi. Each of the four wheels would hold a fourth of that pressure, but the tank, using its wide and long tracks, exerts much, much less pressure onto the ground. Specifically, Leclerc tank exerts little under 13 psi, or some 88 kilopascals. So we're talking about 10 times smaller ground pressure with much smaller likelihood that one wheel will find an unlucky mud pool and lose traction. The artillery wasn't the only issue. Napoleon feared for his cavalry too. An average horse with a soldier weighing over 600 kilos exerts a ground pressure of close to 30 psi, or 200 kilopascals. That's more than the tank even when the horse is standing on all four legs. In the real timeline, horse charges were done at slower speeds than otherwise possible, precisely due to the mud. In theory, nighttime operations would bring a huge advantage to the tank. In 1815, battles were not fought at night. It was impossible to coordinate formations in the dark, to search for targets and so on. But a modern tank like Leclerc has thermal sights which can basically detect a human-sized shape from a few kilometers away, at night and through smoke. But as we said, the tank arrives only after Napoleon wakes up, morning of June 18th. Still, those powerful optics with great magnification would help during daytime as well. The tank would first flank and observe the Anglo-Allied positions, getting a different and better view, plausibly even going around the opponent's compound. There, the first opportunity to truly change history would arise, to try and spot important nodes in the Anglo-Allied forces, the headquarters, perhaps even spot Wellington himself and try to attack him. A modern tank can easily land a precise shot from 2 to 3 kilometers away, basically from so far away that the Anglo allies could not even spot the threat. That being known, we also said such surprise ruins the scenario, so the Anglo allied commanders would try to hide. From the start of the morning, they would likely dispatch more scouts around their camp at greater distances to try to warn of incoming contraption of doom from the future. Here we come to the issue of ammo stocks of the Leclerc tank itself. Was the tank prepared for its time travel mission? If so, it could have been stocked up with a bunch of extra rounds and ammo, better radios and other equipment. But if it wasn't, the usual loadout of ammo a Leclerc tank would carry is this. 40 120mm rounds for its main gun, 22 of which would come within the autoloader's hold and 18 more inside the tank to be loaded into the autoloader. Now the exact composition of the rounds carried greatly depends on the missions. For example, in 1991 Iraq, the US expected to fight against armor only, so they carried hardly any high explosive rounds. During the Cold War, Soviet tank users expected a wider range of missions for their tanks, so half of their total ammo load was high explosive rounds with most of the remaining half being anti-tank heavy metal dart ammunition. There is simply no one true answer, so we'll model it to be somewhere in between, with 15 out of 40 rounds carried being high explosive ones, 5 being heat rounds, which has strong anti-tank capabilities but also does detonate into a smaller fireball upon impact, 15 being armor-piercing fin-stabilized arrows, which contain no explosive filler and the generous 5 remaining rounds would be shells intended for close defense, each holding 1100 metal balls, basically a shotgun type shell. Those are devastating against unarmored targets, but their effective range is maybe 500 yards. 
that's not a lot of main gun ammo, knowing the Leclerc tank is trying to cripple a massive army formation. Wellington had roughly 67,000 men under his command. Luckily for the French, the Leclerc, as any other tank, also has machine guns. Peculiarly, while most tanks have a 7.62mm coaxial machine gun, Leclerc has a 12.7mm one, meaning a 50 cal gun. It comes with 140 rounds ready to fire, plus another 660 stored inside the tank, available for reloads. The good thing about that gun is that it's coaxial to the main gun, meaning it gets to use the powerful main gun sights. Plus the 50 cal itself is a powerful round, and it can achieve very good precision from such a stable firing platform. Using it, the gunner would likely be able to pull off pinpoint precision hits from a mile away, using almost individual shots, rather than bursts. That would be ideal for engaging the Anglo-Allied artillery, actually. It's a heavy and static target, but the single well-placed shot in the middle of its wooden wheel would likely result in the wheel bursting apart and the whole barrel falling on the ground. With so many guns being engaged sequentially, the Anglo allies would not be able to replace the wheels on most of them, so the tank would effectively be putting most of the Anglo allied guns out of action for the remainder of the battle, while keeping the barrels intact, so the French could seize their artillery pieces later on. All that might happen over a course of half an hour. The Anglo allies would of course react straight away. Some of the guns would probably even be turned to protect the rear and the flanks, knowing the tank might be somewhere near, but those guns would essentially be useless against the modern tank. It's not even about armor, it would be about range. In theory, British guns could even fire at a range of 3 kilometers, but that was indirect, imprecise fire. What was much, much more practiced was fire from 600 to 800 meters away. Even then, such distance was usually too big to make fire on enemy artillery pieces worthwhile. Larger target sets were preferred. So what would happen is that, of course, the Anglo allies would try to fire back. From a mile away, there might be some small chance to hit the tank, but it would likely take dozens of shots to achieve a hit, even with a stationary tank. The tank would be relocating every once in a while to mess with the Anglo allies' aim, forcing them to reset the aiming procedure. The tank could even try to fire while on the move, using its gun stabilizer, though that might result in some shots missing, which in this specific situation with tons of targets and limited ammo supply might not be worth the extra benefit of presenting a moving target, which would likely be impossible to be hit for 19th century guns from such distances. Their cannonballs have a shape that's not ideal for punching through armor. Cast iron is brittle and would fall apart when it hits, muzzle velocity is much lower, there is basically no part of Leclerc's hull which would be vulnerable. Nothing serious would happen if the tank got hit pretty much anywhere from a mile or more away, even if it managed to get hit in its metal tracks. Those would likely hold. The only real issue might be if an extremely lucky shot managed to hit straight into the armored glass of the gunner's sight. The glass itself is armored and might hold, but it would likely shatter, making further aiming harder. Still, there is the commander's independent sight to help out, so it's extremely unlikely the tank's sights could be completely blinded. After half an hour or so of fire, most of the British guns would be neutralized from afar. Realistically, some of the anglo allied soldiers would be so scared that they would simply start to flee, but assuming the morale somehow holds that the prior warnings about the tank did their magic, the anglo allied troops would lie down, hide, disperse as much as they can, but not too much, as there's the whole French army waiting to attack them from the opposing side. Now that Napoleon has the tank edge, he would likely even start his attack earlier, probably waiting for the tank to return to a communication range and get a report. In the real timeline, despite Napoleon's early scouting, a lot of anglo ally troops were hidden to him behind the ridge alongside the road, and Napoleon did not know where exactly each enemy unit was stationed tank's report would help him create a more accurate map of enemy's positions. While Napoleon's main attack in the real timeline was a large infantry push in the center and to the eastern end of the Anglo-Allied line, there were also skirmishes to the west, for the Hugomont Manor, a walled complex of buildings which the British had secured for hours in the real timeline. 
that place was important as the French inability to take it for hours potentially cost it a favorable position to threaten the Anglo-Allied force, and forcing Wellington to distribute its reserves to the west, weakening the rest of his line. But in this new timeline, the tank could participate there. It could use its high explosive rounds to shatter parts of the wall much more effectively than cannonballs of the time period could, and to even shatter the buildings inside. It could afford to actually drive into the compound, as there would be little threat to the tank with most British guns neutralized, and ones that maybe remained being tied up defending the central line. The tank would likely again resort to its coaxial machine gun for that mission, but this time joined by its roof-mounted machine gun as well. The XLR variant of the Leclerc has a remote-controlled 7.62mm machine gun, which rotates independently and can be used by the commander. So the tank would storm the compound with two machine guns blazing and likely scare the defenders. Behind the tank and partially protected by it, the French infantry could also pour in, adding firepower. Instead of hours of battle, Hugomont would likely fall within half an hour, possibly by 11 am or so. It's not known yet how many 7.62mm rounds does the XLR Leclerc hold, but the previous generation French tank held some 2000 such caliber rounds for its roof-mounted gun. It's however possible that if the Anglo-Allied troops are trained enough to deal with the tank, they might try to shoot at its sights from such closer quarter distances. A musket ball is still powerful enough that if it manages to get a lucky hit into the optics of the remote weapon module, it could leave a crack on the glass. Multiple lucky hits might even be able to bend some parts enough so that the machine gun becomes unusable. Of course, one can imagine just how much luck that would require. As a side note, previous variants of French Army Leclerc do not have a remotely operated roof-mounted machine gun. Actually, a good deal of modern tanks in general still don't use those. Most of the US Army Abramses and European Leo IIs don't have them yet. Now, a Leclerc with a human manning the machine gun sticking out of the turret would be in a tight spot. The gun is positioned over the gunner's hatch, so it's the gunner who would have to use it, but the gunner is far too important to be risked like that. No 19th century soldier could replace his knowledge and experience. With tens of thousands of enemy muskets in range at any given time, whoever would be operating that machine gun would inevitably get shot eventually. One option might be to pick some 1815 troops to operate the gun, sort of as a fourth member of the crew. That person would be a worse gunner, hitting less often and wasting more ammo, but it would be better than not using 2000 machine gun rounds at all, as those represent 70% of all the rounds carried. Without relying on those, the tank's impact on the battlefield would be noticeably smaller, but the machine gunner would basically sit on the gunner's shoulders, and the gunner would not be able to focus properly on using his sights, the main gun or the coaxial machine gun. Perhaps a better option would be not to use the roof-mounted gun until the coaxial machine gun would be out of ammo. Having a manually operated roof-mounted machine gun would be less effective for France, though it wouldn't change the ultimate outcome. By noon, many French artillery pieces would be placed at Hugomont, threatening the entire Anglo-Allied line and the main thrust and main artillery bombardment would happen as in the real timeline, limited by ground needing to dry sufficiently. So around noon or so, some 80 French guns opened fire on Wellington's troops in the center. Around 1 pm, the infantry attack started. In this timeline, with no serious threat from British guns, infantry might charge even a bit earlier. That charge would be helped by the tank. Even that way, the machine guns would do a lot of damage, though the tank would likely have to start conserving its ammo, especially the ammo for its coaxial and main gun. In the real timeline, the British sent its cavalry to meet and push back the French infantry. Here the tank would likely also shine. Horses make much bigger targets, plus they are easier to scare by the tank producing fairly loud noises. Machine guns would still have to shoot almost individual round bursts, but they would be hitting dozens of horses per minute, from fairly far away. Not like the French infantry, which was in reality terrified of a charging cavalry force and could not even aim properly when in fear. 
It's very questionable if the British cavalry charge would work as well as it did in the real timeline. It could totally break apart, or diminish not really pushing the French back. The French own cavalry attack followed in the real timeline, and that would happen here too, with greater success, as many of the Anglo-Allied forces on the eastern flank would be beaten by that point. The French would have likely established themselves on the ridge, pushing British positions a bit behind. Little after 1 pm, at the start of that infantry charge, the French scouts spotted the Prussian infantry forces closing in, some 4 to 5 miles away. That meant they had another 3 hours to march to the battlefield and help Wellington. In the real timeline, another big French attack happened at 4 pm, after the first one failed, this time somewhere between the center and the western flank. But with the Hugomont compound taken much earlier, the French commander Ney would have positioned his forces closer to the Anglo Allies hours earlier as well. And he would plausibly attack them earlier, possibly after 2 pm. By then the French tank could have shifted back a little towards the French, taking a brief rest before going back in to help Ney's attack. Such an attack would also complicate the issues for the Wellington's men on the eastern half of the line, as they would get less support from the neighboring units. The French attack to the west was spearheaded by cavalry formations, which were in the real timeline met with prepared square formations, where the infantry was waiting for the horses with very concentrated musket fire and bayonets. That was possible because in the real timeline there was no artillery support, but in this timeline more French guns would be brought closer to the front, firing on the Anglo Allies. Plus the tank would be there, a single shot with its canister round into one such square could neutralize dozens of troops at once and likely send hundreds into panic. Similar effects could be had with a high explosive shell. In the end, the tank charging alongside the cavalry would bring extra panic to the British in itself. Not so well prepared to meet the French cavalry, it's likely the British infantry would be seriously affected, especially if the tank would actively try to overrun large Anglo-Allied infantry groups. A company of musketmen, when dispersed by a tank wanting to run them over, would drastically lose its effectiveness and the French cavalry that would follow the tank would then likely pick up those dispersed and panicked enemy troops. The result would likely be a rout in the Anglo-Allied lines on that side of the battlefield. But as we know, and as it had happened to the French in the real timeline of the Waterloo battle, such routes can be contagious, and little by little the entire Wellington's force may lose cohesiveness and start to run away. By now the tank would be maneuvering around for over 5 or 6 hours, Testing of Leclerc tank in Sweden in the 1990s showed that actual maneuvering in tough terrain leads to just some 120 kilometers of range on a full tank, or 75 miles. So even though the area that the tank would wage war on is less than 5 by 5 miles, it would have drove over that area many times, left, right, up and down. It's very likely that by 3 or 4 pm or so, the tank would be very low on fuel. For example, just 20% of fuel remaining in the tank would be gravely risky. The tank crew and Napoleon would likely agree to park the tank on a fairly safe top of a hill, from which it could still use its weapons, covering a large area, preferably one also monitoring the eastern approach, due to the incoming Prussians. The Prussians first came in with two infantry brigades, under the commander Bulow. One linked with Wellington's eastern flank, but in this reality it's questionable if there would be such a flank to link to. The other brigade went straight for the village of Plansnois, taking it. Plansnois would be taken by Prussians here as well, but the brigade that tried to reach its allies would only get shot at by the tank from a distance. Of course by then the tank would likely be almost all out of rounds so those cannon shots might be heavy metal arrows designed for anti-tank roll. Basically, imagine a huge ballista arrow going through a few rows of men marching. It wouldn't kill many, but panic would still ensue. Most of the work, however, would likely have to be done by the French infantry nearby, fighting that Prussian brigade. Most of the French cavalry would likely still be chasing the routing Anglo allies, cutting them down. Luckily for the French, it was only after 5.30 pm that another Prussian brigade, Zaytan's 1st Brigade, came in with 9,000 infantrymen, 
Around 6 p.m. it was joined by parts of two more brigades, totaling yet another 10,000 men. That would make for some serious fights on the western flank of the French army. Though the tank, with its long-range optics, would help there. It would warn Napoleon of incoming Prussian formations in a timely fashion, possibly an hour in advance for each, using its radio. Some of the French cavalry would still be unreachable, pursuing Wellington's men, but part of it would likely be able to turn to Prussians even before most of those formations came. And certainly, there would be enough time for Napoleon's artillery to be placed and shoot at the Prussians. So despite all the casualties the French endured up to that point, which would be high, it's likely that the final fight in the battle would still see French units waiting for the Prussian brigades, with the French being double or triple in size compared to each individual Prussian brigade. Arriving in cascading fashion, it would be only a matter of time before each Prussian attack would fall apart, even without further involvement from the tank. Of course, Napoleon could order the tank, even if it is out of ammo by that point, to simply use up half of its remaining fuel to try to run over the Prussian companies, thus dispersing them and lowering their effectiveness. In the end, the tank itself would not have really killed or wounded that many enemy troops directly. Its 15-something darts might kill perhaps a few troops each, while 20-something heat and explosive rounds might neutralize maybe a dozen or a few dozen troops each. Its several canister rounds might do similarly. Tank's machine guns, even if super precise at a whopping 20% of hit rate, would still yield maybe 600 troops neutralized, with a fair deal hitting enemy horses. The total taken out of the fight by the tank directly might be under a thousand troops. Of course, the tank would have taken out most of the artillery, which would be a huge deal. It is usually said that in the real timeline Wellington had 17,000 wounded or dead soldiers while Prussians had some 7,000 wounded or dead. Napoleon's troops had similar total casualties at 25,000 or so. Some 8,000 were captured as the battle ended, while 15,000 deserted during or after the battle. This alternate timeline with the tank would see those figures change, probably adding easily 10,000 dead and wounded more to the Anglo Allies, and certainly adding several more thousand being captured similar figures might be applied to the Prussians. Though Napoleon's own casualties would not likely be much lower than they were, it would still have been a very bloody battle, as the tank couldn't be at two places at once, and it would still run out of ammo, and eventually fuel as well. Now of course one could talk about further what-ifs. If the tank somehow came prepared with extra fuel, extra rounds and more useful round composition, Yes, that would have made the French victory a bit easier. But not by a whole lot, as there's simply no room or way to cram in more than 50% more ammo and fuel. However, if the tank came with a whole supporting unit, essentially giving it unlimited reloads and fuel refills, then not only would the Battle of Waterloo be a landslide for the French, but many battles coming after Waterloo would see the French emerge victorious until the tank finally gets into an accident from which it can't recover anymore. Equally so, if the tank came in even earlier, like days before the battle, it would have likely pursued the enemy during the night and shaped the battlefield in such a way that the Battle of Waterloo might not have happened at all. But a series of smaller battles might have taken its place, with again the French winning in the end. And realistically, if such a tank just appeared out of nowhere, and no magical information was shared, the French would just think it's the work of the devil, and would likely have not used it at all. Working without coordination with the rest of the French army, it would have been somewhat effective, but not nearly as effective. Though one could also argue that if the Anglo Allies had no warning about the tank, they would have just run away in fear. Who knows? One thing is for sure, 1815 would have no real answer to a modern day tank. The tank would have won the day. And remember, Binkov may talk about war, but only real peace can bring us all together.